This program was produced with funds provided by Grant and Debbie Shermer, the University of Montana Foundation, the University of Montana School of Journalism, and Friends of Montana PBS. Americans always have been a free-speaking people by nature. It's a rather raucous country. And the question really is, when did they defend free speech when it was under challenge? Recognizing the protection of free speech is acknowledging that we protect free speech not because it's harmless, but despite the fact that it can be harmful. You don't use the Constitution as a way to guarantee protection. Because if you lean on the Constitution too heavily, it's going to break. There's a set of 14 words in the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. They meant nothing for a hundred years. It's possible for a democratic country to go crazy at times. In 1918 and 1919, 78 men and women in Montana were imprisoned or fined under the Sedition Act for making critical remarks of America, the president, the government, the flag of war. It was on one side a group of super patriots, and on the other side the people who said what was in their hearts and minds, and it was the super patriots who put them in jail. There's always one value that the society says, if you can give me security in return for this value, I'll take it, it's yours. That value used to be free speech. But when you give up rights, they're gone. And getting them back from the government is an enormous struggle. The idea that uh, we're a culture with a commitment to a very significant amount of free speech and that the government should be kept at bay and that individuals should be able to say things without fear of being locked up is a very modern idea. Nobody worried about free speech before there was printing. In the 19th century, when everybody started learning to read, and you invented a rotary press where you could mass produce large amounts of information, all of a sudden, then, speech became a political event, not just a social event. Because now, all of a sudden, you don't speak to the two, three people in front of you, you can speak to a large audience. The Supreme Court, interestingly, had never decided a case on the meaning of the First Amendment, and therefore, there was no consensus about what free speech was. So most Americans just didn't think about their individual liberties or their civil rights as an important part of their day-to-day -day existence. Today, we tend to think of our rights and liberties as Americans as a fairly important part of our national identity. But in 1917, I think most people did not have the same consciousness of that because they hadn't lived through a period in which those issues were at stake. Summer of 1914, the Great War, what will become known as World War I, begins in Europe. Germany and its allies are soon mired in horrific trench warfare against Britain and France. While millions die in the Great War, America remains neutral. Neither side is greatly favored by public opinion. It's their fight is the prevailing attitude. Prior to the vote on the war, I think the, the sentiment was mostly against U.S. entry into the war. And indeed, when Woodrow Wilson was re-elected in 1916, he was re-elected specifically on the platform that he kept us out of war. I think the reason that the sentiment was so split 
was because of the nature of the United States population at the time. There had been 12 million new immigrants between the turn of the century and World War I. So the U.S. population at the time is very divided because people have relatives on both sides of the war in Europe. Montana was an exemplar of the kind of instability in the United States in terms of population because Montana in the early 20th century has Butte, the largest city between Minneapolis and Spokane, full of immigrants who are working in the mines of a very powerful industrial corporation. There's a lot of debate over how much the Anaconda Company actually controlled the state, but certainly it was tremendously powerful. At the same time, eastern Montana is being flooded with homesteaders. The early 20th century is the period in which the railroads come through and really push homesteading in eastern Montana. So you have new counties being formed, you have new communities, new towns, you don't have deeply rooted, stable communities where people have known their neighbors for generations. Up to 20% of Montanans in that time would have been foreign born. And I think there was great pressure to assimilate, to lose the language, to become as American as you can be, whatever that means. And almost all the cultural institutions of the day were competing to see who could be more American than the other. There were no two sides to the question. You love it or you leave it. You have lots of people coming into town who aren't farmers. Many of them aren't native English speakers who did not look like what Americans were supposed to look like. Often had darker skin, darker eyes, different cultures entirely than what mainstream, many middle-class Americans were used to. I think you could characterize Montana at the time World War I brings out as really a land of strangers. Some of these strangers include Faye and Sarah Rumsey, who come from Michigan to Rosebud County for homestead opportunities, Janet Smith, who migrates from Iowa, and marries sheepman and rancher William K. Smith in southeastern Montana near the Powder River and Hermann Frederick Bausch, a German immigrant who moves just west of Billings, Montana in 1907 to farm. My grandfather migrated to the United States, I think it was 1899. He homesteaded in South Dakota and he lived in a little log cabin. He moved to Billings right around 1910. And he did start some things that apparently hadn't been done in, in Billings before, because he did plant orchards, which all his neighbors thought he was nuts to even attempt. His goal in Billings was to build himself a home. And he was his own architect, and he did build what he calls the brick house, which is still standing. My mother's family lived in the next farm about a mile away. And when he moved there, of course, he was a man in his 30s by then. She was just a high school girl. And he used to see her go back and forth from school on her horse. Of course, when he first saw her, she was a child. But in one of his letters, he says, it amazed me how she bloomed and blossomed. My dear friend, when I finished building the house, I settled down permanently. I had built a bachelor apartment or so I thought. I have known the young lady now in her 19th year, ever since I came out to Montana. Have known her from the eighth grade on up all through high school. Helen and I have been friends, just friends for a long time. The thought of further development never struck me until some time ago when I suddenly found that she had become a woman. Wish me good fortune, my friend. For at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, I shall be married to the dearest and noblest young woman in all the world.
The war had been going on since August of 1914, and the U.S. decides to go to war in April of 1917. Over there, over there, send the word, send the word over there, that the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming, the drums rum. Once the United States decided to go to war, Within a day or two, there are huge patriotic rallies everywhere. The recruiting stations are flooded by young men signing up for the Army and the Navy. And everyone rallies around in this patriotic fervor. So now, respecting this European Holocaust, I cannot see how we Americans have anything to fear from it. Yet, at times, I fear. I myself think that this beautiful land of ours will rather prove that it is an agent toward world peace than one toward world war. I think in general, most Americans were isolationist until the sinking of the Lusitania in 1915 changed a lot of people's minds. war pitted democracies against monarchies. And the average Montanan, I think, would have been supportive of the democracies as an idea. As the Great War grinds on and casualties mount into the millions, Herman refines a philosophy opposed to war and violence. I'm opposed to war, all war that I think is aggressive and oppressive. But if Wall Street plutocrats insist upon further bloodshed, let them also finance it. Voluntarily, I will not contribute to a continuation of this world calamity. There were a number of different groups that were opposed to or raised questions about our decision to enter World War I. On the one hand, there were the socialists, which were the largest political organization to oppose the war. Their view, essentially, was that the reason we entered the war had nothing to do with making the world safe for democracy, uh, as Wilson now built it, but rather that it was essentially about making the world safe for munitions manufacturers and armaments traders who were making billions off the war. If you were a German-American, uh, you were leery of going to war against family members who might still be back in Germany. If you were an Irish immigrant, you were worried about support for the Brits who had been the oppressors in your homeland. So a lot of conflicting feelings, I think, went through the population. I see that this, our own dear country, is not only drifting, but rapidly steering into the very jaws of the war. Every idiot thinks he will be eternally popular if he just joins into the roar. Another group that was very skeptical about the United States' decision to enter the war were the Wobblies. The Wobblies were the nickname for the industrial workers of the world. And they believed that all workers should be organized into one big union. Their view was that the United States was essentially entering the war in order to further corporate interests, having nothing to do with issues of freedom or liberty or justice. Uh, and the working man, the common man, was being sacrificed in order to serve the interests of the wealthy. And in fact, the right of workers to strike is pretty much suspended during the war. After the declaration of war, it became necessary for Woodrow Wilson to generate a sense of fervor if he wanted Americans to make the sacrifices that war demands. To do that, he created the Committee on Public Information, which was essentially a propaganda agency that Wilson charged with the task of producing a flood of lectures, editorials, op-eds, movies, all of which were designed to generate a hatred of all things German and to generate a sense of distrust of anyone who seemed to have doubts about the wisdom or morality or justification for the United States' participation in World War I. I didn't raise my boy to be a soul. It was the 
first real massive propaganda campaign in American history. And the newspapers saw that they had a role to play, and the government wanted them to play this role, and many newspapers bought that uh, program, Hook, Line, and Sinker. You'd read the local paper and you'd find out there'd be the lists of all the people who were supposed to register for the draft. Their names would be printed. So you could tell if Bob didn't go down and register that day. And they would have a list of people who were considered unfit for service. So you'd know who was trying to pull the wool over the eyes of the local draft board. Ladies and gentlemen, I have just received the information that there is a German spy among us. A German spy watching us. They hired legions of people who were prominent in their communities to go around giving talks that were called Four Minute Men. He's around here somewhere, reporting upon you and me, sending reports about us to Berlin and telling the Germans just what we are doing and what people are saying in each community. In the midst of a war, it's sometimes very difficult to see clearly, and most people were very much influenced by this propaganda campaign. The consequence of it was to literally build a sense of hysteria and to cause people to become very suspicious of those within the community who they thought might be spies, might be saboteurs. And in Montana, it manifested itself with an attack on those people who were Central European German-speaking people, and they used the notion that these people may not be patriots because they spoke German or because they prayed in German in Lutheran or Catholic churches. Ein fest der Burg ist unser Gott. We are being stuffed with Hun cruelty, with crucifixions by wild and barbarous Bavarians. Rape, arson, poisoning of wells, execution have become pastimes to the foaming, raving Prussians. I bow my head in shame, shame for the dignity of man. How ridiculous to believe the soldier on the Allied side, a gallant heroic soul, and his opponent, the very incarnation of a demon. Woodrow Wilson has a reputation as a progressive he proposed and carried into legislation a lot of progressive economic reforms. But on civil liberties, he was a dead loss, had no feeling for freedom of speech, whatever. Even before President Wilson sought a declaration of war, he had requested that the Department of Justice begin drafting legislation uh, designed to deal with the concerns of espionage, sabotage, and disloyalty. Enacted just two months after America enters the war, the Espionage Act of 1917 targets not only spies for Germany, but also those whose words might interfere with America's war effort. In the hands of most prosecutors, judges, and juries, any dissent about the war becomes punishable. Speech that questioned the judgment of the president, the judgment of the military, the direction in which they were taking the country, all of which simply weakened the nation in its ability to fight a war successfully had to be suppressed. Herman and Helen's first child, Walter Edward, is born in 1917 in the house that Herman has built. The expectations were high and they seemed to be very much in love and as I say, it sounds very romantic. Here comes little Walter. Our little man is now six months old, and while he's not yet very large, he thinks himself of considerable importance, worthy of undivided attention. This boy of mine is the loveliest, the dearest, the happiest little mortal that ever was. Many a blissful half hour have I spent in my son's presence. Ah, if it wasn't for the peace, the beauty, the love atmosphere of our home, I would not know how to console myself in these awful times. My mother had told me that he had never you know, finished high school. And when I started reading his documents and his journals, my jaw dropped because I was blown away. He was a keen listener and observer. He was not preachy or outspoken in his own values unless asked. I think that all the neighbors 
had great respect for my father. In fact, I think most of Billings had great respect for my father. I shall still passively oppose, but as a citizen of this country, I mean to not only adhere to, but in every way possible, uphold the letter and the spirit of our laws. I shall retire to my little home, away from the city, away from the turmoil and hysteria. I shall live for my wife, my baby, our home, alone. If the races of men insist upon destroying each other, they must not look for assistance from me. My wife shall be my care, my little son, my hope. Under the Espionage Act, the government prosecuted some 2,000 individuals for their opposition to the war or the draft. Many were convicted, and when they were convicted, they were sentenced often to 10, 15, or 20 years in prison. There were a few judges in the United States who actually acquitted some individuals who were regarded by the public as disloyal and as traitors. There were vigilante groups who were so furious about this and, and were concerned that the United States would not, in fact, punish individuals who spoke against the war, that they would go out and take action against them themselves. And in a few instances, that action was so severe that it actually amounted to lynching. In Butte, in the summer of 1917, Frank Little, a fearless, wobbly organizer, speaks out against the Anaconda Copper Mining Company and the war. His opponents call for his arrest under the Espionage Act. But U.S. Attorney Burton K. Wheeler refuses to charge him, stating that in this case, the law does not apply. So Little's enemies take the law into their own hands. After midnight on August 1st, they pull him out of his boarding house, drag him behind a car, and hang him from the Anaconda trestle. Today, our reaction would be, you should punish the people who lynch the speakers. But in 1918, the reaction was, we should punish the people who are getting others angry enough to lynch them. Frank Little's murder prompts calls for a tougher sedition law. The state of Montana is only too willing to oblige. The free air of Montana is too pure, too sacred, and too precious for the traitors and the treasonable to breathe forth sentiments of disloyalty against our cause and to extend comfort to the enemies of the country. Both state and county councils of defense are formed to boost the war effort. They tap into people's fears and suspicions about those who might be disloyal. Citizens are encouraged to report disloyal talk and to lean on those who are even lukewarm about the war. Passivity or not being actively patriotic in this kind of hysterical environment could be seen as being disloyal. If you were poor and decided, I'd rather feed my family than give money to the Red Cross, that could be interpreted as being disloyal. You would hear about a neighbor reporting somebody for using two teaspoons of sugar in their coffee cup or taking notes on potentially seditious comments. You think, what is going on here? Just by making the accusation that someone was uh, a Kaiser lover was enough to throw somebody off their farm and maybe you would get an opportunity of getting their land or worse, their wife or something. There were loans for agriculture. They called them liberty loans. And many farmers were asked to buy property and to take out loans so they could aid in crop production for the war effort. Liberty loans are basically the government borrowing money from American citizens. But it also was a way to enforce patriotism. People were trotted in front of local vigilance committees and questioned about their support for the war based on how many loans they had taken out or bonds they had bought. 
counties form loyalty leagues, and neighbors are coming forward to accuse sheep men and transients and traveling salesmen and homesteaders of sedition. Ben Kahn, a traveling liquor salesman passing through the coal mining town of Red Lodge, has no idea that the man to whom he complains about the war is the chairman of the local council of defense. He happened to be in Red Lodge at the Pollard Hotel and got into a conversation with Mr. Pollard, the proprietor, and he started griping that the food regulations were a big joke. And before lunchtime, he had been arrested. In Wheatland County, a black woman named Minnie Harris was charged with sedition for saying something like, I would rather be governed by anybody other than the dirty Americans. Powder River sheepman W.K. Smith is accused by some neighbors of calling Liberty Bonds a damn graft. Janet Smith is accused of saying the government is killing off all the cripples, insane, and convicts in order to save food. Janet Smith was the postmistress of a little community called Sale. Very barren, remote, isolated country. By all accounts, she was a pretty uh, crusty, uh, hard-bitten old gal and probably was quite outspoken. Her husband may also have been the subject of some jealousy because he had quite a few acres of land and cattle. And the uh, trial account portrays both her and her husband as hard-boiled, unsympathetic people, which is exactly the kind of a personality that you probably would need to survive in that country. They called him Glass Arm. I don't know why. I know he had a reputation for being kind to people, and any of the local farmers there could go to him and ask to borrow something, and he always loaned it to them. Then she made an orange marmalade that I just loved. I always liked to stop there and get orange marmalade. Ernest Starr was somebody who did not contribute to Liberty Bonds, and the word got out in the community, and he was uh, shopping at the general store in Bighorn when a group of men uh, accosted him. And somebody said, why don't you show your loyalty by kissing the flag? He said, I'm not going to kiss that. It's just a piece of cotton. It might be dirty, and so I'm not going to kiss it. And for that, he was charged with sedition. This is the house that uh, Bay Rumsey built in 1914 when he moved here from Forsyth. And he came out here and proved up on this land, a quarter section and uh, moved his family out here and they lived here till 1918 when he was sent to prison. He supposedly said that he wished the Kaiser would come over here and clean up Sarby Creek. Grandpa just said some things that weren't very nice against the government and the government decided to put him in prison. My first recollection was when my mother told me about the day he was arrested. It was a, a pretty horrifying time for both of them. She was taken definitely by surprise, as was my father. Early morning of April 13th, 1918, found me preparing one of my fields to plant into wheat. About half past 10, I noticed an automobile coming through the gate and on down the end of the field where it waited for me. Herman Bosch was a pacifist. He said with respect to the war, it's up to every man's conscience as to whether they should support war or not and whether they should support this war. 
When I came down near where the car stood, the occupants leisurely approached me, stating that they had come to sell me some Liberty Bonds. Have you bought any bonds for the first two series? No, was my answer. Why not? Because I'm opposed to war. And according to the words of one of the fellows there, and then we kind of got a little warm with him, we did. Buy some bonds, you dirty rat. Yeah. I know my mother said it was like a pack of wild dogs, you know, seething. And one of them turned to the other and said, this is a pro-German spy. We need to teach him a lesson, and perhaps we could do it by hanging him from his own apple tree. My mother grabbed the baby and, of course, stood in front of the closest apple tree. And they dragged him into the automobile. They grabbed his wife and his infant child and put them into another car and drove them back into town. They brought Herman into the local Elks Club. In the Elks Club was a mob of 50 to 75 men and women, and they began to browbeat Herman along the lines of, well, if you don't give us a straight answer, by golly, we're going to start uh, beating the answers out of you. And Bosch stood by his principles and said, you know, I'm not going to buy war bonds. I don't support the war. There was a group in the Elks Club who grilled him and grilled him to the point he could hardly remember what he said or what was said. And after several hours of this, uh, they decided they had enough information to charge him. And he was charged. After the Elks Club, they walked him down and put him in a jail cell. A Billings jury finds Herman Bausch guilty of sedition. The judge sentences him to four to eight years of hard labor in the state penitentiary in Deer Lodge. The trial judge in the Smith's case throws the book at them. He sentences W.K. to 20 years in prison and hands him a $20,000 fine, the maximum allowed by law. He treats Janet only slightly less harshly, sentencing her to 10 years in prison. Ben Kahn, the traveling salesman who called the wartime food regulations a big joke, is sentenced in Red Lodge to up to 20 years. Ernest Starr, who refused to kiss the flag thrust at him because it might have microbes, also receives a 20-year sentence in neighboring Rosebud County from Judge George Jones. It may have microbes on it, you say, but I am persuaded that a thousand times more dangerous are the microbes that live under it, the microbes of IWWism, of anarchy, of pro-Germanism, of disloyalty, of dissension and sedition, and the court feels it is its duty to place you where you can no longer contaminate the body politic of this nation. The prison at Deer Lodge had been created during the territorial period in 1871, and it was woefully overcrowded by the time that Montana achieved statehood in 1889. By today's standards, it was a hellhole. When I arrived from my home city, I was so far exhausted that the environment, the horror of this institution, lost a great deal of that poignancy which otherwise would certainly have racked my being. I was so much nearer dead than alive. My first morning made its appearance under banging of steel. This banging of doors in connection with the subdued hasty whisper of many voices give to a person that murky and fatal atmosphere which, once experienced, is never again forgotten. The other new prisoners and I were taken before the warden, weighed, measured, fingerprints taken, and examined as to bodily marks or deformations, our pictures taken with civilian clothes on. Then to the barber shop, to be clipped short and shaved. 
I never knew before how short a person's hair may be cut. From there again to the photographer, where the picture taken now exhibits us in all the glory of the real and initiated convict. Frank Conley was a huge figure in the early history of the Deer Lodge prison. He was six foot six and in his prime weighed over 300 pounds. A hundred years ago, this was a huge individual. And he had a very sort of brusque character. He didn't have a lot of formal education. In 1889, Montana entered into a lease arrangement with Conley and a business partner of his. Basically, they charged the state uh, a certain amount per inmate per day to run it for the next 18 years. He made a lot of money off of the institution over time, particularly off of inmate labor. Inmates are being employed on road building activities outside the institution. And he had a lot of inmates working out on his ranch. It all gets bound up in this sort of capitalist work ethic here. The harder you work, work will set you free, you know, literally. Of course, you know, if you're an IWW or if you're a, a German, work is, you know, work really hard to let you out, but not really. One of the first things that my father really missed was having paper. The only paper he got was once a week when he could write a letter home and it had the Deer Lodge letterhead. And he wrote between the spaces and around the edge. When you compare my grandfather to the normal prisoner of the time, I think he was better educated. I think he had a more philosophical outlook on life. Generally speaking, all prisoners may be classed into three different types. Those men who by hook or crook, misconstructions of the laws, perjury and malfeasance, have been railroaded to prison. Secondly, those who through ignorance, imbecility or recklessness have arrived behind the bars. Thirdly, those harpies, those wandering wolves, who feed consciously and with forethought upon the labor of their fellow men and get caught at it. There is at the present time a large number of prisoners sent here under the recently enacted sedition law. Among about 40 of these so-called seditionists, it is safe to say that not five have actually broken this infamous legislative accomplishment. Had they, according to the testimony upon which they were convicted, really broken the law, then it would be safe to say that 95 out of every 100 citizens of this country also have broken it. He always kept his spirit. He, you know, he writes about, oh, my window faces east, you know, where my loved ones in my home are. I'm forever you know, going east in my mind. I also very much appreciate the photos you sent now and then. I had one in hand a minute ago of Walter showing what a fine little man he has become. How is Walter affected by thunder and lightning? At what time does he wake in the morning? Is there any particular kind of food that he is especially fond of? How helpless how pitiful were his situation if it wasn't for his conscientious young mother. She was just a baby herself at that time, 19 years old, and she took it upon herself to take care of things on the home front. Dearest, I'm downtown and want to drop you a line. Baby is showing good signs all around, but he is quite weak. It takes lots of nourishment. My hands are cold and I cannot write readably. Lovingly, your devoted wife, Helen. Even you know, when Walter got ill, 
My grandmother kept up her optimism, and he's not feeling well, but you know, we, you know, he looks better today than he did. Well, dearest, where shall I begin? After I wrote you the baby was worse on Saturday, he began immediately getting bright and much better on Sunday, although I started noticing his color was not good. On September 2nd, Walter dies of infant dysentery, barely two years old. The next day, a prison guard hands Herman a telegram from Helen while he is on the labor detail outside the prison walls. Were you told baby passed on yesterday noon? Your not being home makes it hard, but it could be lots harder. Courage to my own, yours, Helen. For a moment I stood unable to think as in a dream. I walked away to one side as far as the death line and sat there by myself. It had been a terribly hard day. I'd been standing in mud, knee deep, nearly all day long, doing pick and shovel work. A few cows were browsing in the sagebrush close to where I sat. They sat up to snuff me over, sort of harmony seemingly established between us. These cows were kind, gentle creatures, yet they would respect even a silent tear. My father wrote a formal letter to the warden and asked permission to be let out of prison for two days to take a train to Billings to go to Walter's funeral. He waited and waited and waited for an answer. The warden refused, and my grandfather wrote that at that point in time he was on a, a ditch gang, and that at the time little Walter was being lowered six feet into the ground, he also was six feet underground, draining a swamp for the benefit of the Anaconda Copper Mining Company. Dear Helen, little Walter, our bright eyes has flown away. My heart is bleeding. I am lonely and wondering how sorry I feel. Sorry, my dear, for you. After his parole from prison in 1921, Herman returns to Billings and resumes farming, refusing to yield to the shame of his sedition conviction. We mourn the loss of our beautiful child. That wound is too grievous to ever completely heal. I regret the tears and anguish of my wife, her rude awakening from idyllic regions of beauty and innocence. I also regret the loss of years, the loss of comparatively large sums of money, the ruination of our garden and plantation. But I do not regret the refusal to voluntarily aid in the starvation of millions of children, in the rape of nations, in the upbuilding of a plutocracy that outrivals that of Nero. I do not regret what I have done, or rather what I have refused to do. I have lost much, but I am more than ever in possession of my soul, my self-respect, and the love and affection of my beautiful wife. Perhaps, after all, I have been the gainer. Clearly, we have not gotten rid of war. We have not gotten rid of fear of strangers, of fear of difference. We need to be tolerant of well-meaning differences of opinion and learn to not be governed by fear so that people's um, inadvertent slips of the tongue lead them to broken lives. The Smith's convictions are reversed by the state Supreme Court in 1920 
and they are released from prison. The county prepares to try them again, but gives up in 1923. Ben Kahn's term is commuted by the lieutenant governor. He returns to the road as a salesman, eventually settles near Akron, Ohio, marries and has a son. Ernest Starr's petition for habeas corpus is turned down by Judge Borkwin, even though the federal judge denounces the super patriots who put him in prison. When Faye Rumsey gets out of prison, he is a very sick man. He travels back to Michigan and dies there in 1922. Grandma Rumsey could not manage the homestead and hang on to 12 children. The children were either put in orphanages eventually or let out to other people. My mother couldn't hold us together. She didn't have that, oh, the know-how, I think. I was sent to an orphan's home near Twin Bridges, Montana. I was there for a little over three and a half years. While at the orphanage, Marie's 14-year-old sister, Louise, is operated on for an ingrown toenail. The doctor administers too much chloroform anesthetic and kills her. Marie's mother, Sarah, tries to hold on to the homestead, but soon the property is foreclosed on. Eventually, she is forced off the land. Some of Faye and Sarah's children will never see each other again and it will take their children the rest of the 20th century and beyond to find each other. We lost our strong hand when we lost our father. He was really the head of the family and he was the one that planned and schemed and dreamed and loved us. What I heard mostly is what, when he got out of prison from my mother, not when he went to prison. She said he came home a sick, broken man. And he died of a broken heart. Forty men and one woman went to prison under Montana's sedition law. The last prisoner walked out of Deer Lodge on October 21, 1921. A sedition law would remain on the books in Montana until 1973. I went to the reading of Clem Work's book, Darkest Before Dawn, and I walked out of that reading and I turned to my wife and I said, you know, I think we can get, we can obtain pardons for these people. I uh, didn't really have in mind the idea of pardons when I wrote the book. I just wanted to tell the story. I thought that, you know, perhaps someday these people would be exonerated. A couple of days later, I sat down with my law students and I told them about the book and asked them if they'd be interested in doing it. They were sort of doubtful, you know, because all of these people had passed away since then. And uh, they said, well, yeah, let's, let's go ahead. He took the idea to his students and said, why don't we uh, try for gubernatorial parts? And so there was not only the question of can the governor pardon people who are now dead? But there was the question of why should he pardon people who are now dead? It became clear after, after every one of those cases were studied by the University of Montana at School of Journalism and Law School that uh, these were patriots. These weren't seditionists. And by the time we finished looking at all the facts, it was clear to us, and I think clear to anyone who would look at it, that pardoning these people was unquestionably the right thing to do. Eighty-eight years later, we are gathered here in a moment of redemption and redress. We are gathered to honor these ancestors. Governor Schweitzer has seen fit to grant executive clemency to liberate them and their descendants and all of us from the shame of their unjust conviction. So today, in Montana, we will attempt to make it right. In Montana, we will say to an entire generation of people, we are sorry. And we challenge the rest of the country to do the same. And today, we ask 
that we never forget the mistakes that we've made so that we don't make them again. It was an emotional event. We invited families from all over America that were descendants of these people that had been convicted of sedition. And some of them didn't even know that their great-grandfather or grandfather or grandmother had been convicted of sedition. My great-uncle Martin Winger said that our guys didn't know how to fight and the Germans did know how to fight and that they were going to kick our butts when he spent 18 months in jail for it. It was something, I guess, that, that the family never talked about. They heard bits and pieces from adults talking, you know, that their grandpa had been in prison, but nobody knew why. We had heard rumors that it was from cattle thievery, horse thievery, who knows what. This stain on their great-grandfather's reputation is one that really passed down from generation to generation. And so the pardon erased that stain forever. It was overwhelming at first. The family of Faye Rumsey, please come forward. You know, see the image of my father, because I, I don't have any pictures of him. It brought back the person that was the force in our family. The family of Herman Bosch. If I were to write an epitaph for my grandfather's tombstone, I would say, all people who embrace freedom will never forget your sacrifice. Those were amazing times. Every 40 or 50 years, we have those amazing times, again and again. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, by air. We live in a society, like any society, that's going to get frightened, uh, and, and then it's going to move on, and then it's going to get frightened again. A fundamental lesson of American history is that in these episodes, we learn lessons, but then generations pass and the lessons get lost. The more we remember the bad things that happened, the more we know how easy it is, even in this constitutionally sensitive country, where we exalt the Constitution, we talk about freedom of speech, even in this country, people can be horribly punished for saying things that are a little different but are not acceptable in a time of stress. We shall never let you down, nor your fighting comrades, nor the 15 million people of South Vietnam. Well, I grew up in the 60s and was pretty vocal myself. And with the current state of affairs, with what's going on, overseas and we have the ability to be critical of our government without being thrown in prison it just shows that we've come a long way. Today our very freedom came under attack. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. One thing to watch out for is that politicians of a bad stripe are always ready to manipulate fear. Intelligence gathered by this and other governments leaves no doubt that the Iraq regime continues to possess and conceal some of the most lethal weapons ever devised. I think the value that's collapsed in the wake of 9-11 is the notion that there should be some restraint on the government's ability to investigate citizens. People are sufficiently frightened about terrorism that they're willing to write a blank check to the government, and the government's acting on that blank check. And what we've decided to do now is say, here, take my privacy, but please make me secure. I think when people are safe and secure, they tend not to ask a lot of tough questions. And when they're threatened, they want simple answers quickly. The capacity of the government today to gather information about everything we do through its use of electronic surveillance and the internet means that our vulnerability to the misuse of that information is greater than it's ever been in our history. Today, 
It's not German immigrants that seem to be the ones who are spied on. It's people who are of Muslim faith, Arabs or Iranians. If you don't stand up when it's another group of people that speak a language that's different than yours or have a religion that's different than yours, if you don't speak up when it's someone else, who will speak up for you when it's your family?